This happened 9 years ago in Tennessee. The time was around 10 p.m. when I had stepped out of my apartment to grab a bottle of coke at a local supermarket. It was only 3 blocks away and I was about halfway there when I saw a girl standing on the sidewalk. I was about 10 yards away from her but even from that distance I could tell she was really beautiful. I continued to look at her as I walked forward. Then at about 5 yards from where she was standing, I looked away mainly because I didn't want to scare her and also because I'm not a creep. A few seconds later, there was only a couple of yards of distance between me and her. And in that moment, an old van came to a screeching stop right next to her. Then two guys stepped out and literally threw her inside the van. I still remember seeing the girl twisting her body in the direction of the door. I saw her eyes for a second or two but they spoke so many words to me. Her eyes were filled with despair, fear and shock. It was akin to watching someone being taken for an execution. It took me longer than I would have liked to react to the situation. By the time I was running toward the van, the sliding door was already halfway closed. So then it was quite a miracle that I had my right hand wedged between the door and the frame in the nick of time. In an instant, I had managed to place both my hands on the door but the driver sped off and I found myself tumbling on the ground. When I looked up, the van was already half a block away. There was no way that I was going to catch up to it. I dialed 911 right away and described the situation to the dispatcher to the best of my abilities. The police arrived at the scene of the crime some 5 minutes later. Now face to face, I was able to give them more information that could hopefully be used to find the girl. Sadly, nothing came of the investigation. I was interviewed by the police once more 10 days after the incident. I think it was supposed to be more of a formality than aiding the investigation. Nothing new was said during the interview and the police couldn't give me any updates on the girl either. 9 years later, the incident of that night still haunts me. What I can't forget is the desperation I saw in the girl's eyes. Those eyes, they still shake me to the core. It took merely 10 seconds to change a girl's life from one that's full of potential to one that you wouldn't wish it on your worst enemy. Experiences like that, they change you. Sometimes, I have moments when I'm truly happy of something really good happening to me or to those whom I care for and love. Then like clockwork, the girl's eyes just pop in my mind for no reason whatsoever. And just like that, I go back to being sad again. It's like I'm in a loop of depression and sadness. Then again, I know I really shouldn't complain considering that the life and death of the real victim is still a mystery. In a tragic way, my life and the girl's have been forever fused by the misery resulting from the incident of that night. As long as the girl is missing, I don't think I'll ever be right. It was around 1am and I was on a remote two lane road driving to my brother's to spend the weekend with him and his family. On the way I saw a person hitchhiking by the side of the road which was very unusual seeing as how we were in the middle of nowhere. I normally wouldn't have stopped for anyone but the hitchhiker was a young woman. I hit the brake and the car came to a stop at about 40 yards from where she was standing. I saw her walking toward my car and I won't lie, I thought about leaving her there. The thing is, she could have simply been a bait. It was not out of the realm of possibility that a few thugs might be hiding in the woods. I mean, if they off me here and dump my body anywhere but on the road, the chances of my remains being found intact is close to zero. The remoteness and with the wild animals out here, the location pretty much made the perfect place to commit a crime, period. In the end though, I couldn't leave. I know all too well what happens if you get in the wrong car in places like this. I have a sister. I would want other strangers to show her sympathy in situations like this. I think the saying goes, treat others as you would like to be treated. Hence, that's what I did. I put the gear in reverse and drove the car toward the woman. 
I stopped right next to her, rolled down the passenger side window, then said, You need a lift? And she responded, If you'd be so kind, my place is only 20 minutes from here. Do you think you can take me there? Sure, hop in, I told her. The woman sat in the passenger seat, then I turned on the dome light to introduce myself properly to her. When I saw her face under the light, I couldn't help but be surprised at how young she was. I mean, the girl was at most 18 years old. She couldn't have been older than that. Anyway, she said her name was Christine and we did the whole generic and awkward introduction. As we were driving to her place, she told me that she had a fight with her boyfriend and that he had dumped her on the highway. I didn't really know what to say to that, so I just nodded and kept driving. On the way to her home, she kept flirting with me. She asked me if I had a girlfriend, which I hadn't. She gave me her number, which I didn't want. But what really took me by surprise was her asking me if I wanted to spend the night with her at her place. To be clear, she didn't straight up tell me that she wanted to do the nasty. She simply said, you know, it's really late. If you want, I'll be more than happy to offer you my couch. I think you should rest up and leave in the morning. I'm cool with that. If you think about what she said, regardless of the kindness I may have shown her, it didn't make sense for a young girl to invite a stranger, a male stranger at that, to sleep over for the night. I don't care how desperate a person may be for the nasty, but something like this just doesn't happen in my world. In any event, I declined the offer and things all of a sudden got very quiet in the car. Several minutes passed when I felt a stinging sensation on the right side of my waist. I was about to rub it with my hand and that's when the girl spoke again. I've got a 9 inch blade ready to slice through your stomach. I wouldn't touch that area if I were you. So I calmly asked her, you don't have to do anything rash, I'll cooperate. What do you want from me? Your wallet, cell phone, car, and you out of the car, she answered. I pulled the car over on the shoulder, then asked the girl if I could get out of the car. Instead of answering my question, she instead asked another question. Tell me, are you gay? No, I'm not. I responded to her. Before letting me out, she stated, If you would have said yes to my offer, I would have given it to you. But lucky for you, you actually said no and you ain't even gay. I would have killed you if I would have done you. You made the right call and you get to go home. Get out. I got out of the car and she sped off into the night. I had to walk about an hour to arrive at a gas station that was still open. From there, I called the cops but the girl was long gone by then. My car was found some 20 miles southwest from where I was dropped off. The cops found my wallet in the car, but without the cash, of course. When it was all said and done, aside from being robbed of 20 bucks and a bit of hurt ego, I gotta say I got out of the ordeal fairly unscathed. I'm okay with the whole thing, it wasn't like I got traumatized from the incident or anything like that. But I do think about the girl quite a lot, because I wonder, had I taken up on her offer, would she have really killed me? Perhaps I'm just as big of a lunatic as she is because I just can't seem to get her out of my mind. I actually have a thing for her. Like I get really aroused when I think about that night. I know it's a psychotic thing to say, but I assure you I'm being frank with you. If I ever get to see her again, calling the cops would be the last thing I do. I would try to make her mine. I legit would. My husband died in a car accident last year. The past 9 months have been the most trying time of my life. I severed contact with friends and family, stopped going to church, and I think all I did was to work, eat, and defecate. Last week, I decided to move back to my house. I had been living in a rental apartment ever since Daniel passed away. I just couldn't live in the same space where he and I had made so many wonderful memories. I ran away from everything that reminded me of my husband. But you know, with time, I've learned that there's no running away from memories. 
I might have escaped the house that was filled with Daniel's personal touches, but even away from the house, there were cars of the same model that Daniel drove, Starbucks coffee shops were everywhere and Daniel adored their coffee. Every direction I looked, there were things or places that reminded me of him. I missed him and I wanted to remember him. No amount of distance from the old house could stop my mind from bringing up his memories. Therefore, I moved back into our old house. It was time to face the reality and I had to get closure somehow. It was the only way I was going to survive. It was strange going back to the house on my own. Daniel was a sculptor and he used to work in the shed in the backyard of our house. Back in the days, I could always find Daniel in the kitchen at around the time I would come home after work. He would always cook dinner for me regardless of how tired he was or how much work he had in the backlog. That was never going to happen again. The first night when I went to bed, I felt so happy. Sleeping on the bed we used to share, I don't know, but it almost felt like Daniel was embracing me as I fell asleep. It was the first good night's sleep I had in months. Starting from the second day, I began going through Daniel's things to sort them out. Some things I've donated, many others I had thrown them out. So aside from the photos and a few very personal items, I emptied the house of everything that belonged to Daniel. I did that not because I wanted to force myself to forget him, but rather being at home, it felt so much easier to face the world on my own. It felt as though Daniel was right next to me as I made those decisions of what to get rid of and what to keep. A month after the move back home, the house looked better and cleaner than ever. It was also around that time that I began to invite people over. And I suppose you can say that it was the starting point of re-establishing my previous relationships. One day after my parents had left my house after dinner, I went into the study to put away some books that I had read multiple times. I do this on a regular basis. Aside from the classics, I normally shuffle the bookshelves with new literature. As soon as I stepped into the study, I saw a tiny memo sitting on the floor right next to the bookshelves. I thought it weird since I spent the whole day with my parents and the study hadn't had any guests that day. But regardless, I picked up the memo and the moment I saw the writing, tears began to flow from my eyes. It was Daniel's writing and the contents of it were for my eyes. The memo read, Lisa, baby, I witnessed a horrible incident while I was shopping at the supermarket today. A gentleman who looked not much older than 40 had a cardiac arrest and died at the scene. As much as I felt so sorry for the family of the man, in my selfishness, I couldn't help but put myself in his position and to imagine what torment you would go through if I suddenly dropped dead. So I decided to write this memo for you in case anything were to happen to me. I also thought it'd be a good idea to put this note in between the pages of your favorite book. I know you read this book at least once every couple of years. My message to you, Lisa, is that I'll always side with the things that are best for you. God forbid something bad happens to you, but if it did, I know you would have the same message for me. That is to continue living your life to the fullest. Your sadness could never translate to my happiness, but your happiness will always bring joy into my soul. Keep me in your heart, but don't let me out until the day we reunite. I love you so much. We should get it on tonight. That was the message. I cried so much that night, but the tears were tears of joy. I loved Daniel so much, and I certainly knew he loved me too, but the degree in which he expressed his love, I could never match it even on my best day. Through the note, he had bested me again. Daniel had somehow freed my soul from the eternal guilt of living a full and meaningful life. The note, dare I say, I don't think it was an act of a moral that I somehow found it on the floor. 
Daniel was with me through the suffering and the eventual overcoming of them. The note was the last piece of the puzzle that could bring about the final closure. He did that for me, even after death. I love you with all of my heart, Daniel. We'll see each other again one day. Goodbye. It's 5 a.m. and I'm in the bathroom to do the usual morning routine. I've got an exceptionally important meeting to attend in Sweden, and that happens tomorrow. I gotta catch a flight this morning and thus the reason for such an early start of the day. I go up to the sink to wash my face, but what the hell? I see three arms in the mirror instead of two. I look down and it's there. Right next to my left arm is another arm that's moving on its own. It's doing things, but it's not me who's making it move. I try to touch it, but my hand goes through it as if I'm trying to hit something in a virtual reality setting. Actually, let me add something to the statement. It is correct to point out that I cannot touch the arm, but it would be incorrect to say that my hand merely went straight through it, like there was only air. I think the sensation was more like wading through water. There definitely was friction and or resistance, but it was minimal. With that said, I take a closer look of the arm and if seeing a hand moving in the air isn't weird enough, the arm looks exactly like mine. I mean, the hand was the giveaway. I recognize my hand when I see it. Then suddenly it disappears. Now I'm left thinking, did I just hallucinate or did that really happen just now? The apparition lasted at least a minute and that's what I find it to be so odd because here's the thing, I've had moments when I had seen weird things appearing for maybe a split of a second, but that happens to everyone. 100% of the times we see things we shouldn't be seeing because from time to time, our eyes and mind like to play tricks on us. It just happens. We are imperfect beings. But for a minute, a full minute of hallucination, that kind of thing doesn't happen unless you're crazy. And I can tell you with absolute confidence, I am not crazy. I used to work as a high school security guard from the year 2002 through 2009. I don't recall the exact year, but I think it was either in the year 2003 or 4 when I had witnessed something truly inexplicable. So here's how things used to work in the old school. Period 1 starts at 8 a.m. And the last period, period 9, ends at 3.30 p.m. When school ends, most kids leave the premises for the exception of a few who may be talking to a teacher. So bottom line, the classrooms are empty by latest 4 p.m. every day. We are supposed to do our rounds until 5 p.m. when everyone for the exception of the janitors and at times, the principals stay past the regular hours of operation. It was around 4.30 when I was sweeping the second floor that I saw a student still seated in a classroom. It was a female student and she looked really young. I went over to her and said, What are you doing in the classroom? School ended an hour ago. I waited for her to say sorry, whoops, or something along those lines, then leave. But she didn't respond at all. In fact, she didn't even look in my direction. Okay, I need the second floor to be empty. That's the only way I get to go home. So, will you please leave? I played it with her, but again, I didn't even get an acknowledgement of my presence. A couple of seconds passes when Jeffrey, one of the janitors in school says to me, go home Roger. I turn around and respond, I'm trying but this girl won't let me go. To which Jeffrey responded, what girl? So then I said, this girl, as I turned around but the girl was no longer in her chair. The classroom was empty. I looked in Jeffrey's direction and asked, That can't be right. Didn't you see a girl when you stepped into the classroom? Yay tall and freshman young? Nah man, it was just you in this empty classroom. Man, stop trying to scare me. 
Do you know how creepy things get when y'all live? Jeffrey complained. Yeah, sorry, I was just kidding. I sort of just mumbled and walked out of the classroom. I finished my sweep, then got out of the school at around 5 p.m. As I drove home, I tried to reason with myself that I must have been spooked and imagined the whole thing. The truth is, I knew I was knowingly BSing myself. I had never been one to get scared of ghost stories or other similar nonsense. I wouldn't imagine seeing things because I've never believed there were real ghosts in our world. At least, not after I turned 10 years old. But regardless, it was easier on my mind to chalk it up to being spooked. So that's what I did. Only that lie I made up was unfortunately debunked a week later. I had seen the girl again, and again, and again, you get my drift. The good thing is, the girl really didn't do much. I saw her walking in the hallway a few times, but mostly she just sat in the classroom. Obviously, I was scared of her initially. With time, however, I began to feel bad for the girl. It's not what she said or did that made me feel that way. I think it was the aura of sadness that she carried with her. If that makes sense. I saw her one last time in the winter of 2009 before I quit working school security. Even today in 2019, I often wonder if she's still around. I should mention one thing before I close off. I did do a little investigation of the girl while I still worked the security job. I have found the names of several deceased students who have attended the school, but I couldn't find anything that stood out. A few kids died in car accidents, a couple of them were taken by cancer, and so on. I didn't find a single student who would have the reason to frequent the school after death. So yeah, I never got to find out why the spirit of the young girl showed up in the same classroom. I just hope it wasn't anything tragic or sinister that has sealed her faith. Although her not being able to move on sort of hints at something unfortunate. Well, I pray that I'm wrong and I hope that she'll somehow find her way to God. To preface the story, I first have to tell you that I come from a very average family. My family is not poor nor wealthy. I hail from a middle class background. With that out of the way, I went yachting the other day on a humongous and insanely luxurious yacht. So how did that happen? Well, I started dating a girl some two months ago. I'm 20 years old and Lucia is 19. We go to the same college and we've met at the campus. Long story short, Lucia's father is a very wealthy businessman. Unlike most of the wealthy girls, Lucia doesn't drape herself in luxury goods, nor does she drive an expensive vehicle. That's the reason why I thought I was dating someone who hails from a similar background to mine. Therefore, two months ago, I could have never imagined that I'd be traveling in a luxury private yacht. Lucia told me about her father's business some two weeks ago, and I got to hang out with her family a week after that. A couple of days back, I got a call from Lucia and she asked me if I wanted to join her and her father on a fishing trip. I happily said yes and that's how I ended up on her father's yacht. The yacht was huge. I saw at least 20 crew members manning the ship and so that should give you a pretty good idea of how big it is. We were in the middle of the ocean by the afternoon. Let me tell you, the view from the upper deck was mesmerizing. I saw blue as far as the eyes could see. I felt so small and insignificant out there. Strangely enough, however, that made me feel so alive and exhilarating. You know, they say money can't buy happiness. But whoever this day person is, I think they're lying. If what I felt that day wasn't happiness, then I don't know what could be classified as being happy. Anyway, the weather was perfect and we couldn't have asked for a better day to go fishing in the open ocean. 
we were talking, laughing, and fishing on the lower deck toward the stern of the yacht. Everything seemed splendid when out of nowhere, and this happened really quick, a thick fog had engulfed our vessel. And then we saw it, an enormous cargo ship that dwarfed our own big ass yacht. If you want to compare sizes, then picture a broom next to a light pole. Our yacht was a little over 100 feet long, so do the math. Our captain quickly changed the course of our ship to put a little more distance between us and the cargo vessel. At least, that's why I think he did that. I'm not a sailor, but I do know that ships take forever to come to a stop. The two ships were a little too close for comfort. The fog was so thick that we couldn't see the cargo ship until it was almost right next to us. Lucia's father flicked the switch that changed the sounds coming from the speakers from music to the conversation taking place in the bridge. From what I could gather, the cargo vessel wasn't responding to any communication attempts. The captain mentioned something about the ship drifting at sea without any power. I think that meant that the engine of the cargo ship was off. Everyone, including the captain, seemed to have been confounded by the abrupt appearance of the fog and the ship, when suddenly our eardrums were ripped to shreds by the deafening horn sound that was coming from the cargo vessel. We all covered our ears and some even went down on their knees because their ears were hurting so much. Then the fog became even thicker. In fact, at that point, it didn't even seem like fog anymore. It actually seemed more like smoke. We couldn't see anything past a couple of feet in front of us. A minute went by like that, then the horn stopped. The fog dissipated extremely quickly, then it looked unnatural and the cargo ship was gone. How is that possible? A ship of that size shouldn't be able to move that fast. Acceleration has to be painfully slow. That you can deduce simply with common sense. I even asked the captain if he's ever experienced anything like that, and he told me everything about it was strange. He stressed that he had never seen fog descend so fast in his 30 years of maritime experience. He said that it was unnatural, and that's his own word by the way. He chose the word unnatural to describe the fog. And then there's the cargo ship. By the captain's own admission, no ship of the size should be able to move so fast as to disappear from our sight in less than a minute. Physics does not allow it, period. Jesus, what a look. You date a girl whose father owns a yacht, and your first outing on it, you get to see a ghost ship and fog that comes and goes with a flick of a switch. Suffice it to say, you won't be seeing me going back out to sea. In fact, I dread the day that Lucia's father invites me back to another fishing trip. I hope he never does. Hey guys, Dennis here. I apologize for the long absence, but it couldn't be helped. I was uh, out of state for the most part of the last two months. Work was keeping me busy and I was not in a position to make videos, especially being on the road. But anyway, I'm back and I'll resume the normal upload cycle until I don't. <laughs> I'm sorry guys, I don't mean to make light of the situation. I mean, you guys have subscribed to this channel for contents and continuous delivery of new contents is what you guys deserve. With that being said, however, the reality is that I have to make a living. I've got a career and YouTube is my hobby. I wish YouTube were my career. Trust me, it'd be a lot more fun to run a channel full time rather than trying to run it with such limited time that I've got on my hands. I'm not saying that you should be happy about it, but I think you would understand my situation. We all gotta pay the bills. But yeah, uh, like the last time, I'll try to upload as many contents as I can before I inevitably have to fly off to half a dozen states to attend the long and tedious business meetings. I'm off for the next two weeks. I've made the company a substantial amount of money in the last two months. So I've got a little thank you package from the higher ups which includes a two weeks vacation. In that time, I gotta do a little landscaping in the backyard, I'm gonna play lots of video games, and most of all, I'll try to make as many videos as I can for you. 
Oh, and one more thing. I wrote a bunch of scripts for different types of videos before I left for the business trip. I wrote one about Deja Vu and the many potential explanations for it. That video is completed and I'll be uploading it tomorrow. I've got a series of contents on science and mystery. I'll be uploading them together with the usual contents I make. Oh yeah, 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 sorry, uh, one last thing. I've got a huge backlog of submissions that I have to make use of in the videos. I apologize to all of you who've submitted the stories. I'm rewriting them as fast as I can. I'm sure I'll be able to feature your stories in the near future. I appreciate the submissions, keep them coming, but please know that it takes time to turn your stories into videos. Thank you. I hope you guys have had a lovely weekend. Goodbye for now.